Okay, two in a row. Now we get to talk about some things clinical, right, which, uh, you know, I'm not the kind of uh, uh, chair that just goes to meetings, all right. I've had an active, active clinical practice, which is still active, doing about 250 joints now a year. Now I'm just uh, shoulders and knees, so I'm a very, uh, it's been a very gratifying and important part of my practice. And in that context, the advent of reverse shoulder replacement has certainly expanded and enhanced my practice. These are my disclosures. Most significant for I have designed a shoulder replacement system for Exact Tech for which I receive uh, uh, royalties. All the other ones are, are there. So why did reverses get developed? Because we had a problem. We had a problem if you did an anatomic shoulder shoulder replacement in the rotator cuff deficient shoulder, it didn't work. There was nothing to stabilize the humeral component within the glenoid. So the solution was to design a shoulder arthroplasty that did not rely on the rotator cuff for range of motion and stability. Fairly simple, and there's an example of one which looks more like a total hip than, uh, than a uh, shoulder replacement. But the problem was, it wasn't that successful. Before Gramont developed his, these are some examples of the constrained shoulder replacements that were designed to treat the rotator cuff deficient shoulder, right? And the fact is that they had a, a pattern of consistent failure. These are just some drawings from the patent office of that were patents that were registered for different implants that you've probably never seen, right, that people thought they ultimately could be successful. So these laterally, uh, laterally based center of rotation devices uh, uh, were basically were failures. why they fail? Because the glenoid component loosened, right? There was too much stress on the glenoid component. And then along came Paul Gramont. In 1986, this is his prototype of a reverse shoulder replacement, a polyethylene humeral component, a, a hemispherical glenoid component. Now, my chief at that time, Viktor Frankl, came back from, from Europe and he said, I saw this reverse shoulder replacement, you should go uh, take a look at it. Now, back in those days, if your chief told you to do something, you just did it. Back in those days, if your chief told you to do something, you just did it. I tell that, that to my residents all the time, but it doesn't seem to resonate, all right? <laughs> so I went there. I, Paul Gramont didn't know me from anybody else. He was an incredibly gracious, all right, host, the operating room, dinner, lunches. He was incredibly uh, gracious, a gracious host. I saw him do a lot of things in the operating room. I saw the reverse. I saw some other, what I would consider unusual things, glenoid osteotomies for rotator cuff tears and such. So I came back and Victor Frankl said to me, well, said, Joe, what do you think? I said, well, Victor, it was interesting, but I don't think it's ever going to catch on. <laughs> okay, so don't ask me about stocks or anything else, right? I'm not the guy. So the fact is he came up with a semi-constrained design, non-anatomic design for patients with rotator cuff deficiency. Even though it was a fixed fulcrum device, he medialized the center of rotation, and he distalized the humerus, which gave it the biomechanical orientation, right, to allow the remaining muscles, the deltoid, to function as the motor of the shoulder. Now, the, the, the device that I showed you in the previous slide, that was not ready for prime time. It went through a whole lot of modifications, and thanks to people like Walsh and Boileau, ultimately they helped develop the Gramont design reverse shoulder replacement, the first of which is shown here. And after a successful track record in Europe, it came to the United States. It gained FDA approval in 2003 for a single indication, and that was rotator cuff arthropathy. Now, if you go to the FDA website now in 2022, the only indications for reverse shoulder replacement are rotator cuff arthropathy and revision arthroplasty with a rotator cuff deficiency. Those are the only two that the, from the FDA's perspective. In reality, we use this for so many more uh, indications and which I'll review. But one thing you should recognize is not all reverses are created equal, although the reverses of different designs, whether it be a medialized center of rotation, a lateralized center of rotation, the so-called Frankel prosthesis, or a combination of the two, right? They have all uh, documented a very high track, tra uh, track record of success, and that's consistently across the board. From the early years, I'd say 2003 to 2010, things have changed much, much uh, differently in the last 10 years. And we've got a lot to choose from. This is just a partial uh, uh, listing of the different reverse implants that are out there, 
right? And there are, I could probably have two more slides with different implants. Now, if you look at what's happened over the last five years with respect to the use of reverse shoulder replacements versus anatomic replacement, right now, reverses are used much more commonly than anatomic replacements. This is, this is some data from the industry, and you can see in uh, reverse shoulder replacement in 2016 was about 55%. It's now almost 70% in 2021, and as that's occurred, the percentage of anatomic total shoulder replacements have decreased. Now, before, in preparing this talk, I looked at my last 200 cases. So my last 200 primary shoulder replacements, I did 140 reverses and 60 anatomics, so basically a 70-30 split. However, if you look at the first year of that, two years ago, right, or the, the rather, uh, the, hundred, the first 100, it was 6634. But the last 100, the most recent 100, as of April 1st, going backwards, it was almost 75% reverses. So right now it's unusual for me to, if I've, uh, maybe it's one out of five, right, uh, uh, anatomic replacements. It's almost like I'm looking for, I have to find a reason to do an anatomic replacement these days because the results of the reverse have been so positive. So when I think about the expanded indications for reverses, I, I'm going to list them here. There's the massive rotator cuff tear without arthritis. Now, this is in addition to rotator cuff arthropathy. Somebody comes in with a massive irreparable rotator cuff tear without arthritis in a certain age category, reverse. Glenohumeral osteoarthritis with an intact rotator cuff, I will still do a reverse based upon certain clinical factors, and I'll go over that. Glenohumeral OA with significant glenoid deficiency. For me, if I can't reconstruct the glenoid with an anatomic and feel that I have secure uh, fixation or long-term fixation of the glenoid component, then I'm gonna do a reverse. It's used in proximal humeral fractures. If you, right now, it's either you fix it or you use a reverse, right? Or non-operatively, you, you fix it or you do a reverse. The role of hemiarthroplasty, I think, has gone by the wayside. For me, patients with true rheumatoid arthritis, irrespective of the rotator cuff status, I'm going to do a reverse. Because I think as a collagen disease, the rotator cuff is not going to function well, and I think they, will, they do better with, with uh, a reverse. I, for some reason, I see a fair number of patients with Parkinson's disease, right? You know, and years ago, I had a lot of failures with anatomic uh, replacement with Parkinson's. Now, anybody with Parkinson's is going to get a reverse. Post-traumatic arthritis, particularly, is an indication for reverse. People that had previous open anterior shoulder repairs, particularly with tight anterior structures or compromises of the subscapularis, are reversed. And I've used this reverse in patients with, who are upper extremity weight-bearing, people that are paraplegics that use their arms for transfers. Now, one of the reasons I do that, even if the rotator cuff is intact, because I put them in a sling for two weeks, right? and let, then let them start transferring at that point, with rare exception. It facilitates their recovery because they need their upper extremities to be able to do this. And then, of course, revisions. So if you look at this, the easy one is rotator cuff arthropathy. There's no choice there. This is an example of a massive rotator cuff tear without arthritis. And some people may do a superior capsular reconstruction, tendon transfers, and there's a role for all that. But it, once you get past that, I think the reverse is certainly an important indication. Now, then you talk about, as I referred to before, glenohumeral osteoarthritis with an intact rotator cuff. So which of those patients will I consider for reverse? Well, you look at the, the lower slide there. Somebody with that degree of glenoid erosion, and in this case, over 90% posterior subluxation, I can't effectively balance that joint with an anatomic replacement, even using augmented glenoid components. So that, that patient with significant glenoid deformity is going to get a reverse. Uh, significant uh, issues related to age, right? I would say anybody over the age of 80, right, I'm going to do a reverse in. And that may be creeping down to 75. As my age goes up, that number creeps down, all right? Okay. <laughs> then proximal humeral fractures, both acute and subacute, and, and as shown on, on your left, this, uh, this uh, relatively high nonunion, that's that's, in the old days, I do a hemi and reattach the tuberosities. Now I do a reverse and reattach the tuberosities. Post-traumatic arthritis, to a greater or lesser degree. When I've done anatomics in post-traumatic arthritis, and one of the things about post-traumatic arthritis is there's no such thing as one x-ray. Every x-ray is different. Look at the x-ray on the left versus the one on the right. 
that, that degree of deformity, the degree of rotator cuff compromise, really has to be understood. But I, even with minor greater tuberosity malunion after, uh, after fracture, I've had not great results with anatomic. So I tend to move towards reverses. And patients with a previous open anterior shoulder repair, because they can be sublux posteriorly, they can be tight, the subscapularis can be, can be compromised. And if you don't have a good subscapularis, you're going to have failure of, an anti, of the uh, anatomic replacement, right? And of course, revisions. Now, one of the nice things about revisions with the systems that are out there now is the so-called uh, uh, convertibility. You know, there are some humeral components that can be converted to reverse, which saves you the problem of of uh, having to revise the humeral component can be challenging, particularly with cemented humeral components. So you see uh, the, uh, the x-ray on the left. This particular implant is a convertible replacement. We only had to uh, basically work on the glenoid side, whereas the x-ray on, uh, on, your, on your right, we had to replace uh, uh, both components in order to get this to uh, uh, be a reverse replacement. So I think particularly uh, failed hemiarthroplasty and failed anatomics, to me, is a reverse. So basically, are the indications for reverses expanding? Absolutely. More common now than anatomic replacement. And I think those numbers are going to continue to increase. I think we're going to settle in about the 80-20 range, frankly, right? The only thing that's going to change that if, is if we find out that there's some major problem with reverses that occur over time that we, that we didn't know about. And that's already happened once. Uh, with scapula notching and the uh, Gramont design. That medialized center of rotation predisposes to scapula notching, uh, which basically was a, a design flaw of the implant. Because once they did the bio-RSA and bone grafted the glenoid and moved it laterally, the scapula notching went away. But there's nothing seemed to be anything else on the horizon. The incidence of scapula spine fractures, relatively, relatively low, particularly with some implants. Uh, I think as we understand the outcomes, we're going to be able to tell patients with more definitively what they can expect as a result of a reverse is based upon their, uh, their underlying diagnosis. And that, frankly, I think that most people see it as an easier operation than anatomic replacement. My uh, trauma surgeons at our place, they're very adept at, uh, at doing reverses on trauma patients, but they would never do right, an anatomic right, in a, uh, in a, for an elective case, right? Frankly, it's an easier, more straightforward operation. However, it's not without its, its concerns because in, in many markets, the cost of a reverse implant can exceed the Medicare reimbursement to the institution for the, care, for the DRG providing that care or close to it. That's not a winning model, and I'm surprised there hasn't been more of a pushback from institutions about the increasing utilization of reverses because financially, it's not a great deal for institutions. So that's, uh, uh, you can expect to hear more and more about reverses going forward, right, as opposed to anatomics. And that's just a little bit about our department, and I'll stop right there. Thank you.